But ultimately, and I think Mark tells this story very well in his book, how the trial judge, Justice Zabedin, despite all the pressures brought on him, and how we, we, we thought at one point, it was so clear that Anwar would be convicted, that even he, he had to recognize the case had such a big hole in it that could not be covered up. And what was that? And this is where Zabidin felt he couldn't cross the line. It was just too much a travesty of legal honesty, you couldn't cross it. And this was because when the samples were taken from Saiful's bottom in the hospital by the doctors, they were carefully put into test tubes, sealed, labeled, and they were put into a plastic bag which was hot sealed, permanently sealed. And this was done in front of the I.O., the investigating officer, Jude Pereira, in front of him. And what did Jude Pereira do? This is on Saturday night, 26th of June, 2008. What did he do? Instead of delivering that bag straight to the chemistry department the next morning, as a responsible investigating officer would have done, he kept it in his filing cabinet. Not only did he keep it in his filing cabinet, he cut open the bag. He cut open the bag. And this was what Justice Zabedin said, I can't accept that. There was no good reason for him to open the bag when the bags were sealed in front of him. There was no good reason. And as the defense experts from Australia, uh, Dr. David Wells, Dr. Brian McDonald said, in any court in the world, in front of a fair judge, the case would have been thrown on that alone. When the investigating officer cut open the bag and said, I had to reseal, I had to repackage the samples in a different bag. So on that alone, the case should have been thrown. And Justice Zabidin did throw the case on that ground alone. He said, I can't accept the explanation of the I.O. He said, oh, I had to re, I had to open the bag, I had to reseal it in compliance with IGSO, Inspector General Standing Orders. He said, I don't buy it because it was sealed in front of you and you knew how it was sealed. Why do I therefore maintain it's a political judgment? I make my case simply on the basis of how the Court of Appeal behaved. Uh, if any of you have the time and the inclination, Mark's report to the IPU, the Inter-Parliamentary Union, about the Court of Appeal is there for all of us to read. It's a scathing report, and rightly so, because the Court of Appeal showed to the world beyond any doubt that this case was about politics. It wasn't about the offense. And why do I say that? Because the appeal was fixed for April 2013 to be tried. April 2013. The dates were fixed, 10th to the 14th. Karpas office was informed. Everybody was clear about it. But suddenly, lo and behold, what happens? Karpal is summoned to the, to the uh, chambers of one of the trial judges. The case is fast forwarded to the 6th and 7th of March one month earlier. Karpal says, I'm sorry, I've got cases on that day, parted cases in Johubaru and somewhere else. No, no, don't worry. We are going to postpone those cases. This case must be heard on the 6th and 7th of March. And why was that, ladies and gentlemen? Some of you may remember the key event that was going to happen on the 11th of March. And what was that? Nomination day for the Kajang by-election. You couldn't get it more blatant than that. That the agenda had been set. Anwar Ibrahim, who had announced his intention to run for the position of Adun in Kajang, who is now, of course, Dr. Sri Wan Aziza, and of course, from then on to move to the position which Saudi Azmin is now occupying, the, it was very clear that that had to be stopped at all costs. 
And how could you stop it? The judiciary had to do it. And that's what the judiciary did. The judiciary played out the script which somebody else had written. So you can't get a clearer demonstration of the political judgment that was rendered. It was not a case about the facts. Because, and there is there in the, I use the Court of Appeal because that is where you see the nakedness, the political nakedness behind this judgment. But I must say, the federal court was a lot smarter. The federal court was smart. They gave us a very patient hearing, didn't they? <laughs> Eight days. Apparently, it's now the longest criminal appeal in the history of the federal court. And that's just to prove how patient they were and how they allowed defense counsel to say everything that could be possibly be said on behalf of the appellant. And so it was said. But the outcome was no different. Because everybody knows that the political threat in the person of Anwar Ibrahim still had to be dealt with through the system. And Mark puts it very judiciously, impartially. He says, there wasn't sufficient evidence to convict. I totally agree. As I said earlier, if you go to the facts, you could demolish the credibility of Saiful. I mean, that's not too difficult to do. But leaving all that aside, as Justice Zabidin did, he threw the case out just purely on the fact when the I.O. cut open the bag. And the other aspect, I think, on which probably any fair court in the Commonwealth, applying the same rules, the same principles, would have thrown the case was on the DNA. And let me tell you that story because it's a, it's a nice little story which Mark tells in his own words and I hope I just capture the essence of it for you. Well, it's about semen and DNA, two parts to it. One is the fact that Anwar Ibrahim turns out to have superhuman semen <laughs> because the semen is somehow able to produce analyzable DNA when it's obviously physically, you know, not supposed to be able to. After 36, I mean 60 over hours, 96 hours, thank you Mark. After 96 hours, it is still capable of being analyzed and producing results. History in terms of semen analysis, uh, forensic analysis and so on. That alone would have been a major question mark. But the other aspect of the DNA was this. And this was a story, and this is based on the prosecution story. And I'll, and I'll wrap this up in a few minutes. This is Jude Pereira's own narrative, huh? the story in court by the prosecution. Saturday evening, or oh, the, the incident is on Thursday. So the DNA is sitting in the so-called, I mean, sitting in the boy's anus from Thursday to Saturday. On Thursday night, in the on Saturday night in the hospital, the samples are taken, put in the test tubes and put in the bag. And they're not kept in a fridge as they were supposed to be, they're kept in a filing cabinet until Monday evening and they arrive at the chemist at 7 p.m. on Monday. And this is the story told by the I.O. himself. This is what he did. And the defense experts, and this is where uh, they demolished the case by saying, Dr. David Wells and Brian McDonald pointed out two key things. One, Brian Wells pointed out the seals on the test tubes, in the bag that, that Jude Perera cut open, those seals were actually removable seals. Which, which was why it was so important that bag should never have been cut open, the bag that was hot sealed. Now, then what Dr. Brian McDonald said, and Brian McDonald is a global expert on DNA. He writes the textbooks, he lectures the, the experts on DNA. And he said this, he said, Going by the prosecution story, the DNA that was finally, that arrived in the chemist lab on Monday must show a serious amount of degradation. Based on the prosecution story itself, it must show it because 
It wasn't kept in a fridge, high temperatures, it is going to degrade. And when you test the DNA, you will see the degradation in the, in the reports, in the profiles. And when the reports were shown to a presenter of him, the profiles were presented and asked, Ram Karpal asked, Dr. McDonald, don't you agree that these profiles show pristine DNA? Prof Dr. McDonald says, yes, this DNA is pristine. And that itself would have thrown the case. Because what Dr. M Professor McDonald was saying was, the DNA that was being presented in court, or the profiles that were being presented in court, were not the DNA that was supposedly taken from the complainant's anus on Thursday. So, I mean, we don't have the ridiculous story that Azizan told in 1998. You know, the story that he was sodomized in a building that didn't exist. And as I said, the prosecution got it smarter. They, they uh, well, not the prosecution, the conspirators uh, put together a smarter job, but it still wasn't good enough. And the story should have been thrown. The case should have been thrown. And ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we all have to thank Mark Troll here for, you know, for the service that he has done to, to our country and to us as Malaysians for having put this together. And this book, and I hope that uh, in the near future we will translate the book, because I think this story has to be told in Bahasa Malaysia to our entire people, for all of us to understand that this is not just about Anwar Ibrahim. This is not just also about Anwar Ibrahim's family. In manipulating the judiciary, in doing the injustice that they did, the injustice is to Malaysia, to us, to the whole country. Why? Because the institution has been damaged and manipulated. And I think for lawyers especially, for those of us, Amiga, a number of probably in the crowd who, who go before this institution, I think we feel the pain. I felt it that day on February 10th when I saw the judgment being rendered. I felt the pain. I felt the emotion because for lawyers like us who go before that institution on a regular basis, pleading our cases, making our arguments, and to see the way the institution was being used because a political threat in the person of Anwar Ibrahim had to be stopped, that was sad. Not just sad, it also made us angry. But for all of us sitting here as citizens of Malaysia, it's a reminder to all of us of the challenges that we face. The, 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 the duty that all of us must undertake. And that duty is no less than to fight this battle, to fight it in the way Anwar would want us to fight it, fight it well, fight it to the end, so that generations after us will be able to enjoy true freedom, true independent institutions, a real democracy where the judiciary would protect people and not be used to oppress people. Thank you very much.